Thank you for being here. Welcome to the sixth annual Ampersand Live. I'm Michelle. Forterra works to make the most of land that contributes to the well-being of our communities and our environment. Ampersand Live is a space for thinkers, doers, and artists to share what's in their hearts. Each will speak their own truth not necessarily Forterra's or that of the other performers. The mystery will be what rises from their fires. After all, what's a good story without a surprise ending? Now, I've heard rumors of chainsaws, but honestly, how this turns out will be as much a surprise as, to us as to you. You saw the quote when I came on on stage. I've been reading a book called Wisdom Sits in Places, which is written by Keith Basso. And he shares stories that Western Apache elders wanted to be shared with the wider community. Western Apache elders spoke of stories that they call arrows. These stories, when they land with a wayward person, that arrow, it burns and it offers wisdom. So tonight, as we gather together and are warmed by a fire on one of the darkest nights of the year, we may also feel the burn of a few arrows that land well and true. So that's because artists like jesters in Western culture or coyote in some indigenous cultures are truth tellers. I invite you to gather around the fire and to set the corners on our space together tonight, we're honored to have join us Ken Workman. Ken? Halturi to ha. Halturi to ha kadesha padacho hali. These are the words and this is the language of the Duwamish people. This is the language that we were forbidden from speaking for so very long. But now we're beginning to hear our words and they're coming back. And we're able to stand on a stage before you on days like this and once again come out of the shadows and once again speak in our own way. And these are the words of my great, 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 great grandfather, Chief Seattle. And so it's an honor for me to stand here before you today and say, It is good to see you, my friends. And I'm just thanking you for driving on these crowded streets to get here to this place today. <laughs> and so what I would like to share with you here today is a simple little story. A story that my grandfather spoke of in 1855 just as he's getting ready to sign this Point Elliott Treaty that gives away all of this land of Seattle. And he said to the then Governor Isaac Stevens at that time, the very first thing that we require, well, what he said was, I'm going to take this, this thing that you have given, I will take to my people, we will let you know what we think. But know this, this is the very first thing that we require unencumbered access to our burial grounds. This is important to us as Duwamish people. We had 92 massive houses around this area, right over here on the Duwamish River. Duwab Stolak. Stolak is river. Atihibach Stolak on the Black River. Atahachu, Lake Washington. This area was rich. And so he said, we want unencumbered access to our burial grounds because you must understand 
that as Duwamish people, we have been living and dying on these hills for thousands and thousands and thousands, for millennia upon millennia. We have stories of when it was cold and there was a great war, and then the cold went away. And in all of that time, grandma and grandpa, aunties and uncles, they have been going down into the ground in these places that we call Kayo Ali. These are um, cemeteries. And so when Grandpa said, we want unencumbered access to our burial grounds, he also said, you abandon your dead and you think they're powerless. But they're not entirely powerless. And that the ground is more loving to our feet than it is to yours. And so if you can imagine that we have wandered these hills since the Ice Age with no shoes until just recently, and so the cells of our feet are in direct contact with all of our ancestors that are down in the ground, all of those people that have been down the, for there for 10,000 years. And this is how we talk, very much like the elephants of the Serengeti who talk through their feet using ultra-low frequencies over vast distances to other herds. This is how we talk to our ancestors. And then he said, when the lights are out, and the streets are empty, they will throng with the ghosts of my people. And so when you take all of this and you put it in the context of modern science, you realize what he was saying, that all that material that was grandma and grandpa and aunties and uncles and Yayelab, um, the Yayelab are the ancient ones that have passed. All of that stuff that was down in the ground, it comes back up through the trees, through those roots. And then the trees in the springtime, the leaves come out, and they give us the oxygen that we breathe. And so grandma and grandpa continue to work even today, giving us the fresh air, the crisp air right here in the Pacific Northwest. And so we say, which means thank you, grandma and grandpa, for your heart for your strength, and for the work that you continue to do today. And so, in buildings like this, in these old parts of Seattle that were built in 1909, they have massive beams in some of these buildings. And a simple trigonomic function will tell you how old that tree had to be in order to be in this building that was built in 1909. And that will tell you that in those buildings are the DNA of the Duwamish people. And so when Grandpa said, the streets will throng with the ghosts of the Duwamish people, of course they will. You built your buildings out of us. And so this is the reverence that we have for our houses that are made out of these trees. Because we recognize Grandma and Grandpa are in those trees and they continue to give us the shelter from the rain and from the wind. And so we thank them. And we say, Thank you, Lord, for your children. For your grandmas and grandpas. And for the ancient ones that have passed for their lives. That we see you, the ancient ones that have passed, and the very food that's sitting on our table today, and so we are grateful for that. And so today I am grateful that you are here in this place for this event, for for terror celebration today. And just as my grandpa stood on the shores of Alki 168 years ago, and he said, it means come ashore. He said, come ashore, my friends, onto this land of the Duwamish. He said, welcome, my friends, you are welcome here. Today, as Duwamish, we continue to do the same thing. And that we recognize that the world has grown much smaller today. And so we say, which simply means we welcome all people from around Mother Earth, onto this land 
of the ancient Duwamish people. And so it's my honor to once again say thank you and welcome. Oi. O siem, o siem, na stille cha, na stille cha siem. Jenny White Quench, Guella Quench, Satia Tang at siem, na stille cha, Chiokten, Sinna Snat, Chale at Sin at Hussein, it's Lea Tula, O siem. It's really good to see everybody. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed that uh, music. And uh, we're here with a prayer. I am Chiokten from Hussanich Nation. and. Uh, we're Coast Salish people. We're the people that have been here since time immemorial. 
And we're here with a sacred promise. We come with the voice of our ancestors, with the cry of the unborn children, and the prayer that we can create a future for them, and the prayer that, that we can save our culture by standing up today and working hard for that. And so we put together an organization, Protectors of the Salish Sea, and you can all check that out on Facebook if you like. And uh, we occupied Olympia recently. We walked 47 miles. That's right, it's okay to clap about that. We sacrificed our bodies and our time away from our family and walked four days along the Salish Sea. And we ended up from, went from Tacoma LNG and where they put a, a huge 8 million gallon tank on Puyallup's estuary illegally, and we walked from there to Stachos, our village site, and where the Olympia State Capitol is, where they put that state capital on top of. And we set up four indigenous structures, and we did that without asking, because that's our village site. Those are our ancestors that are under our feet there, as our Coast Salish people, our Salmon Nations people. And, and, uh, and so we proclaim that we've returned to the bones of our ancestors and we're here for our children and there's nothing that you can do to, to change that because we've been here for 30,000 years and we're not going anywhere. That's right. <clears throat> and I let them know we came there with a prayer for our children and our salmon and our cultures and, and, uh, and I said that, you know, We've been here that 30,000 years, and these, uh, these officers that wanted to negotiate with us for us to leave and take down our indigenous structures, and I said, you know, we've been here for 30,000 years, and I said, if you had been here for 30,000 years, if and when you're ever here 30,000 years longer than me and our people, then you can tell me what to do. And until that day comes, I'm not going to do that. Right? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, just uh, we, we say that because that what represents the, that Washington State Olympia capital there, uh, we come from, we're elder society people. We're people that come from elders who raise children, literally. Elders raising a child. And then, uh, then they... they put that teaching in their bones, in our bones, and, and we become an elder society of being tens of thousands of years of putting ancient teachings in the Hachusida, Natsamat, of the children. And, uh, and I said that, that, sadly, this is an adolescent government from a society that didn't have an elder and, and didn't have an elder council of women to guide them towards life. And... Uh, and so that, that's what we're working on returning, indigenous governance that has to do with creating paradise and creating wellness and creating true peace amongst all beings and an indigenous education system that says once the teachings are alive and some of the elder people, then we, we bring that right to the child with nothing in between, nothing in between, because that's what they took away from us as they took our children away. They worked, they knew that we wouldn't have access to the teachings no more because the children couldn't speak to the elders no more because they wouldn't speak the language, you know. So uh, that's what we're working on. And, and uh, we thank each and every one of you. Thank you, Ampersand Live and Forterra for having us here and Duh Duwapsh people. I raise my hands to the Duh Duwapsh, the Duwamish people for having us here on their territory, walking on the bones of their ancestors, as Ken Workman said. And uh, we can all raise our hands to the Duh Duwapsh if you like. This is gratitude in Coast Salish. And, and uh, we shouldn't be lazy about it. Lift them way up high. That's right. Lift them up. Lift up the Duwamish. They don't have recognition. We need to work for them too. And then, you know, we got Turkey Day coming up. We can do something for them. Re write a letter to the government, hey? And write a letter to Jay Inslee. Tell him to declare climate emergency. Could we do one chant real quick and then we terminate those fossil fuel expansions? Can we do one chant? And we'll do it four times. Just say, Jay Inslee, declare climate emergency. Can we do that four times? One, two, three. Jay Inslee, declare climate emergency. Jay Inslee, declare climate emergency. Jay Inslee, declare climate emergency. 
Jay Inslee, Declare Climate Emergency, OCM, Heishka, thank you. Thank you for listening to those words, standing up for the children's future. OCM, Tlomasista. tell you a story of home, identity, place, and creative practice. So I'd first like to acknowledge the Coast Salish people who have called this place home long before my family ever did. I'm privileged to be able to call two places home. They are places that I am freely allowed to live, visit, and return to. So I want us all to remember that there are many others around the world who are forced to flee the places that they live in and that they love. Their native language is suppressed, their homeland stripped away. To have another language is to have another soul. I equate these words with my mother. Although it's a borrowed quote, its origins matters less to me than the meaning. My other soul is found in her language, svenska. I grew up speaking Swedish, but I am born and raised in this region, from a small town on a peninsula near Tacoma. My mother is, of course, Swedish, and my father, American. So I spent many summers in Sweden growing up. When I was 10, I traveled by myself to stay with my grandparents. The details of that strip are scattered, but what remains is this very distinct memory of the sadness when I returned. I came home from the first day of the new school year crying. My classmates, while not bullying me, were entirely indifferent to my adventure. They didn't care that I spoke Swedish or about what I had done over my summer. I didn't feel seen or understood. And I didn't necessarily have the words to express what I felt. But even at the age of 10, I knew that half of my being and my soul were on the other side of an ocean. It's my first concrete memory of feeling in between. In between two homes, two places, two cultures, two identities. And it's a feeling that has stuck with me ever since. My mother and I often joke that it would be nice to live on a mythical island somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, a physical manifestation of a place in between our two worlds and realities, a home for all of the dimensions of our souls. Art is also a language, an expression of the parts of ourselves that we cannot describe through other means. To create is to communicate, to bring this innermost part of ourselves, our souls, into the world, to give them a home. I think this is why I've always felt drawn to a creative practice. I write, I cut pieces of paper, and the in-between space fuels a creative fire, giving me a new language for navigating and finding a sense of place and presence. I moved back to my hometown four years ago. My parents still live in the house that they built and that I grew up in, and it's a rural community situated on a peninsula. It can feel far from many things, but it's where I have roots. My great-grandparents homesteaded here. My great-uncle ran the local hardware store where my father spent his summers working until it burned down and had to be rebuilt. I ride past it on my bicycle every time I go to the library. So home is the Pacific Northwest. The smell of low tide, fiery sunsets behind the silhouette of the Olympics, the unfurling of ferns in springtime, a path in the forest to a yellow house, pockets of salt water in between barnacle-covered rocks. But home is also Svedia, coffee on the balcony with Murmur, collecting wildflowers for the table, bicycling to the lake for fika, sunbathing on granite rocks. Borta bra men hemma bäst is what we say in Swedish. Away is good, but home is best. But we can feel at home geographically, and we can feel at home culturally. And sometimes we have one and not the other. 
because our roots aren't necessarily in just one place. And just like home isn't always a precise GPS coordinate, but instead found in sounds and smells, in colors and seasons, in landscapes, people, stories, and memories. The landscapes of my two homes share a lot of similarities, so perhaps it's no surprise that I'm drawn to the meeting place of land and sea, an island, a peninsula. This too is an in-between space, tumultuous boundaries where the land meets the sea, one gradually changing and shifting into the other. In the environment, that's known as the edge effect, where there is a greater diversity in a region where the edges of two ecosystems meet. We are literally richer existing in the in-between. And whatever home we define, all of us are somewhere in between. The only natural state is a state of flow. I'm reminded of this when I spend time outside. Nature requires presence, as does creativity. The tighter you hold on to an expected result, the less you end up enjoying the journey along the way. To create, to live fully, is to honor process over product, because in the in-between space, we thrive. Creativity is elemental as much a part of our human existence as earth, water, air, and fire. And what is creative practice if not an endeavor of navigating the in-between, finding a home, a landing place in between idea and concept? And if art is our language, then the in-between space is our home, one that we are constantly creating, building those mythical islands to ground and root our souls. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Whitney Monje, and uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight at the Moore. Uh, welcome to Ampersand Live, and thank you to Forterra for asking me to be a part of this. Um, we're gonna be doing an original tune of mine tonight, and it's a song called Serenity, and I sat in the back trying to think about what I was gonna say, and um, this is it. I realized that I wrote this song about playing with fire, and that fire for me was drugs and alcohol. I'm genetically a little more dispositioned to be more of an abuser in that way. So um, I wrote this when I was very young and didn't really understand what the consequences of that lifestyle would be, the rock and roll lifestyle. So now that I'm a little bit older, um, I wanted to bring this song out of the archives and tie it in with some visuals. I collaborated with Blazing Space, AKA John Thoreau, to bring you some amazing visuals. And I have the amazingly talented Amanda Jarman on bass and Chris Acasiano on drums. Without further ado, this song is called Serenity. No, 
just what is mine But I refuse to see the light That's who I'm supposed to be, yeah And don't identify the claim Just for some serenity, serenity, serenity much. Grandma, since I can't text you, I wanted to read you a note I'd written to you. And so you can call me if you've got time for that. If you don't, during your day here, you can phone me anytime. And I know that you don't work tomorrow. And if you don't have plans and I'm looking Seven for something to do, it's going to be a nice day. I'd love to have you come for so lunch over, and you can do a task I... or two if you wanted to. Fly away so, I, I've got the note, and uh, I hope, uh, hope I'll have the chance to read it to you. If not, you can read it if you come over tomorrow. So you can't come tomorrow. Fly and I know that there are lots of things you want to do and people you want to see because they're very limited. So, what I want to tell you, darling, is Manny is a hard job and requires patience and knowledge and stamina. The name the of you of this trait when I, I thought you were looking for another job because you were just when you were bad. But usually you want to be here when you have 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 to be here from this prison walls of life If you are, give me a call If you want I I'll hear you at some point Bye
toes on my feet So when I was about 20 and my little brother was about five, I went over to Bainbridge Island and I brought him a gift. I went to a little toy shop on the way there and they have at this toy shop little jelly bean rocks. They're edible rocks. Oh, are they gray with speckles? I've yeah, seen they look perfectly like rocks. Oh, they're lumpy. Yeah, they're lumpy and sugary and... Um, I bought a little baggie of these and I went over to his place and uh, before he came home from kindergarten I went down to the beach and I placed one of these rocks next to every clamshell that was down there and when he came home I said David do you want to go down to the beach and take a walk and he said yes and I took him down there and I said David did you know there are some rocks you can eat 
And he said, no. And I showed him, like, you have to be really safe about it. And so I picked up a regular rock and I poked my finger into it. And I said, if so, if your finger can't go in the rock, then it's not an edible rock. And I threw it down. And I picked up one of the edible rocks and I said, but if your fingernail can go in, then you know it's an edible rock and you can just go like this. Mmm. And they were bright pink on the inside. And his eyes just lit up. He was so happy. We spent the rest of that afternoon just zooming around the beach, trying to find edible rocks and eating them. And then 12 years pass, and I've never told a soul this story. And I'm on the phone with my little sister, his little sister too. And for some reason, the subject of jelly beans comes up, and I tell her the entire story. And she gets off the phone and she immediately goes and tells the whole thing to him. And later I get a message from my little brother that just says, a telephone message, that says, I, I hate, hate you. you. I've believed this for years. Even recently, I have walked with my friends and I have told them, do you know that there are some rocks you can eat? And they've just kind of looked at me weird. And this entire time I've I believe that there were edible rocks out there, and, and I've been searching for them. Hi, I'm Stefan. And that was a true story. <laughs> and it happened right here. And I think, if I am correct, my little brother is here in the audience. <laughs> Are you here? I just want to say, what's that? <laughs> That's the opposite of what you said, David, before. My little brother is all grown up, a bodybuilder and a chemist. I like to think that maybe something I did activated <laughs> this interest in David. I'm very proud of David. I'm very proud of you, David. He is working on curing blood diseases at the Seattle Children's Hospital. And I think he might have something in his pockets to share with the people around him. Some <laughs> You might want to check to see if it's edible first. And if you don't get one, there are some hidden in the lobby.
Hello, everyone. My name is Neil Welch. Thank you so much to Fortier and Ampersand for having us tonight. This is a wonderful event. Before I want to go any fur we go any further, I want to thank the house band, Tomo and Lena and Chris over here. Yeah. Tomo invited me to play tonight, and I'm just thrilled to get to be here. Um, I'm going to be joined tonight with percussionist and woodcutter Marie Rice. Who's to my right here? The piece of music you're going to hear tonight was inspired by a trip that Marie, who's also my partner, and I took to Banff and Jasper during the wildfire season a couple years ago. And while backpacking out there, really encapsulated in this deep fog thickness of smoke that was everywhere all around us, really made us reflect deeply on the, the gift that we have here in the Seattle area of the fresh air. And Marie and I spend a lot of time backpacking and a lot of time camping, and I have this habit of bringing my instrument pretty much, well, everywhere we go. And that includes when we go backpacking everywhere. So there was one experience we had while Marie was cutting wood, and I'm sitting there practicing my horn. And I'm thinking to myself, this is, to me, the most natural thing in the world, because my idea of sound on the saxophone being a brass instrument with a little piece of wood attached to it and hard rubber and metal, all this stuff that comes together. To me, it's this physical object that really represents so much about the environment that I'm in, all the things around me, be them urban, rural, and, but particularly for me, the sounds of nature, crackling birds, extraordinary things that I can hear and experience and hear my music through that. So the piece of music that you'll hear tonight is inspired by the gift of the gift of nature, the gift of this, of many trees here that you're going to see that, um, you know, have sacrificed their body as a living organism for us that we might have warmth. So the sounds you'll hear are going to explore the sacrifice of that tree, the laceration, gnashing, the gnarling, the tearing, but ultimately it's gift of warmth. Thank you.
My name is Greg Lundgren, and I am an artist and curator and founder of the new Museum of Museums. Uh, this is what I believe in, so I wanted to get, make sure I said that first. Uh, Museum of Museums is located on First Hill in a mid-century medical building that we are currently converting into an art space. Um, it's owned by Swedish Hospital, and I've rented it, or leased it, since May of this year. Um, I've lived in Seattle for 25 years, and there's a lot of reasons why I live in Seattle, but the main reason is because I've always felt that Seattle has the capacity to be and create a renaissance. Um, I think that it's a bold statement to, stay, to say, um, but I do believe that there are very few cities in the world that have the creativity and the talent and the resource and the community and the wealth and the technology to do it. Uh, it is a bold thing to say, and it makes me nervous saying it, but I've spent a lot of time trying to convince people that that is actually true. Um, the way that I do that is by creating art space. Um, my first uh, art space was in Belltown in 1997. It was an old uh, uh, Vietnamese restaurant on 2nd Lenora. And um, it was the first time that I've ever had a storefront. And uh, the first show that we did there was called Five Artists, Four Murders, Three Dominatrix, Two Clowns, and One Bartender. And um, it was a really fun night. And uh, the, the point of it, though, was uh, to be this countdown of a new era of contemporary art in Seattle, one that was immersive and interactive and performative and playful and challenging and fun. Uh, that gallery was torn down and turned into a Starbucks. Um, my second space was in South Lake Union. It was this brilliant. Uh, car showroom that was built for the World's Fair, for the Seattle World's Fair. And um, it was on the corner of Westlake and Denny. And the first show that we had there was called The Dogs of Medina. And uh, we drove to Bellevue with cameras and scoured the streets of Medina and took photographs of rich people's dogs <laughs> and their dog tags. And we handed out those photographs to artists and asked them to paint portraits of rich people's dogs. And then we sent those rich people's dogs owners invitations in this attempt to create a uh, patron class for uh, <laughs> regional artists. That gallery was torn down and became Whole Foods. Um, but I still try, and I still create art space, both real and imagined. Um, I produced Out of Sight, which was an exhibition that ran tandem to the Seattle Art Fair for three years. Um, I created a model for uh, the Lusty Lady building called Walden 3, and more recently created a outline for um, uh, how Seattle could invest in regional arts with the price tag of $1 billion called one half of a football team. Um, I, I do these things because I believe that Seattle is a very good city, but that it has a capacity to be a great city. And I do not see a version of a great city with a declining artist population. I think, I think if we are going to be a great city, that we have to be growing our artist population, that we have to create opportunities, we have to create energy, and give reason for people to be here and create work. I want artists to flock to Seattle the way that gold miners and loggers and fishermen flocked to Seattle in the 1800s. I want artists to quit their day jobs. I want artists to tell me about their European vacations. I want artists to invite me on their boats. <laughs> I want artists to bring a decent bottle of wine. I really want artists to be rich. The Museum of Museums has a lot of moving parts to it. It's the hardest thing that I've ever done. It has two main galleries. It has rotating private, uh, private collections. It has space for children's art. It has space for video art. It has sculpture and installations and pop-ups and art classes and a really, really unique gift shop. Um, but our mission 
our mission is something maybe a little bit different than other museums, and that is, is that I think we have the capacity, or at least I want to try, to take all these ingredients that we have, take our creativity, take our talent, take our community, take our wealth, take our technology, and remix these ingredients and find a way to make the city that I think that we're capable of being. Our goal is to convince you that we are capable of a renaissance. So I hope you can join us in February. Thanks for your time. Because I'm of native stock, and yes, I'm made of rock. I'm formulating koi sand plants from where the civilized cradles rock. Like Papa Dante, oh maze lot. On oh, my tail to my sacred ancient thoughts. For formerly colored fairies that play with hot lava. Do not bother with the drama. Obsidian armor is harder. Creation stories, the glory of one of Pele's daughters. So I'm Mele. When I always rep the south end That quote is me nombre That coma is the mountain I'm sailing in the sailish shit Navigating what my sound is You know that I will own this I was born near the Snohomish Swim with the fish to Swinomish To the harbors where the oats live Ciphering an eclipse of moonlight As Hidmo closes Ancient lyric spirits dancing in canoes Upon the ocean Tying tight song lines between coconuts And cedar trees creating famine native land Chief Seattle said we can't eat money 
We deeply breathe in Temescal Buddha sage, drink the tea Clats and gamati me down my ass He's signing Tlalo de Kudli Pond that kernel birthed in a turtle island metropolis Since time immemorial This is where the Duwamish live Displaced kids reclaiming our red paint And so hip hop with it Honoring with glacial flows I'm dropping in Hi there, thank you so much. My name is Tamara Power Drudis, and <laughs> thank you. Uh, this theater and this place have a lot of meaning for me, and many of my favorite humans in the world are here tonight, so um, it's a real treat. I'd like to share with you a short science fiction story that I wrote for tonight's theme. This is called Smoke Chaser. At the top of Maloney Ridge Lookout, Dolan woke with a song of thunder on her tongue. She'd heard the tune before from the trees in the forest below, and she hummed it now as she rose stiffly from the lower bunk. Mmm. -hmm. She maneuvered into her jumpsuit. A rumble erupted from the sleeping mound hunched in the chair by the burn boss. His black beard flashed translucent as the AI blinked with incoming dispatch. Stuart, she groaned, flipping the coffee machine to reheat. He disabled her alarm again, working a double so she could sleep the extra hours. Dolan activated the burn boss to view the incoming message. Smoke report. Satellite incom images incoming. Could be a false alarm, but it had been a long drought. Open command post, she dictated to the burn boss. The AI complied, augmenting the satellite images against the cab's wraparound windows. A plume was visible in the overlay, but the footage, it was minutes old. Dolan grabbed the binoculars from her usual stool and scanned the horizon for smoke. There, she could see the anvil cloud approaching toward Maloney Creek. 10.13, we got a dry storm coming up the valley, she reported to the burn boss. It glowed politely in response. Humidity at 19%, Dolan read from the hygrometer. Winds gusting, 32, edit 35 miles per hour. She grabbed the biocoder translation device even before the burn boss emanated a fire warning. Stuart roused with the smell of burning coffee. He squinted, disoriented by the satellite images and darkening dawn. Looks to be a day for a backburn stew, she said, seeing that he was awake. She passed him the good binoculars and rested into her stool. Think you're up for flying solo? Stuart eyed her, noticed the strap of a biocoder over her shoulder. Flying solo because you'll be where, he asked suspiciously. Ever since Dolan had fallen unconscious during a recent solo expedition into the forest, Stuart had taken to nannying, a genre of help Dolan hadn't requested. Ah, uh, get off my case, she said, reaching for the carafe of yesterday's leftover brew. Your hands are better with the remote, she handed him a mug, and someone needs to send an alert to the forest network. Dolan's left foot was already slipping into her boot. Stuart knelt, 
to help her with the laces. Just stay near the fire line in case you need me. Don't go hiking down to Suga alone again, okay? The pseudo-Sugo Menzisi tree she called Suga had become a point of contention in the lookout. Stuart believed the trek was too far in Dolan's condition, but in her incondition, Dolan would argue, she needed Suga most. Dolan tilted her head non-committally, rising with Stuart's steadying hand from the stool. They unlocked an ignition drone, and Stuart carried it down to the landing while Dolan began her descent from the tower. The drone made launch above her, and Dolan watched it glide across the Douglas Fir connectivity zone, dropping spheres to scatter on the forest floor below. They bounced along, igniting into flame. Dolan reached the ground. Mmm. She hummed again the tune she had woken with as she reached the edge of the fire line and looked to see if Stuart was watching. A flash of light illuminated the landing where he leaned over the railing. Controller in hand and chin toward the horizon, he didn't notice Dolan shuffle across the ridge into the valley. Thunder propelled her onward. Her feet knew the scramble without instruction. She arrived in the grove as the temperature spiked, casting her hiking poles aside and crumpling from exhaustion at Suga's roots. Her thin limbs shook like the needles above her. We haven't much time, she cooed to the lichen-covered tree. Dolan clipped one end of the biocoder behind her ear and the other to Suga's only visible root, where a hookup had been installed and where her body fit perfectly within the curve of the epidermis. She leaned gingerly back and cleared her mind to convey through the biocoder. Through their mycelium-connected roots, the forest network sung Dolan their greeting. It's a concept they call asnes, though it's difficult to translate verbatim. Dolan sung along in her own human way. Mm -hmm. Already, Suga could sense the fluids accumulating in Dolan's throat. Already, she knew what Stuart had only predicted. Her time of succession has come, Suga thought though she saw no reason to burden her human with such inevitabilities. With a flash and a crack, the storm's cloak darkened. Fire, the network announced. They continued sending updates as the flames swept the floor, traveling swiftly upslope toward the grove. A seed born of fire grows to welcome the flame, or so the network tells their descendants. It's a wisdom passed down from conifer to cone, and it stuck with Dolan in her years collaborating with the forest. She thought of it now and trembled. Thunder gripped the grove, and the network paused to listen. When no rain fell, they resumed their vibrations, beginning to sing of succession. Dolan lay, listening through the biocoder, drifting as they sang of usness and decomposition, as they hummed of the cones waiting in their canopy for the plunge. Mm -hmm. Dolan flicked at a falling ember. Through the biocoder, the network sang into Dolan's imagination. No longer sure if she was dreaming or conveying, she cradled all the closer to Suga's great root. Her lungs breathed hot. A haze glowed around them. And as her humming fell to a murmur, the forest network sung Dolan to sleep. Thank you. Theater. Somebody make some noise up in here one time. It's a firestorm, y'all. We're 
go by the name of Black Stack. It's our pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fire storm. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. It's a fire storm. Daughters fussing, got nothing. What you want from them? Start scheming, daydreaming, forming teams and out to get it. You know the reason. Any season, any hour, any coward, any goon, I'm just consumed. Hazy eyes, I don't lie or apologize. You know why? I'm the guy. Fast at it, come at it. It gets tragic, but I gotta have it. But addicted, come scripted, but. Open, hearts open, some hoping they can get me rope or get me choked in. With distraction, I like action, I like traction, I like satisfaction. It's a fire storm! Like the challenge, can't balance, can't see. It's all blood, sweat, so we all bleed. Got greed, gotta eat. Hunger, pain, still remain. I hear the slang from the more gang. We got things and never tell too much and never talk too much. So such and such, yeah, such and such. Fire! Thank you. Perry, Arkansas, on the far end of a field, a small wooden house on stilts, the kind black tenant farmers commonly lived in. Underneath that house, between the floor rafters and the caked earth, a seven-year-old boy builds houses, one after another, out of red clay, his bare hands, and the fertile waters of his dreams. 
He crawls out from underneath the house and walks into the field, joining his two older sisters, his mother and his father in the work of weeding and plowing, sowing, tending, and harvesting the bounty of someone else's dreams. He will return to his own dreams tomorrow to add another house to his tiny clay nation. And the day after that, and for as many days again, for as long as he must, he will continue his private labor, keeping his own dream alive. 1947, Seattle, Washington. After the second great war of our time, the boy who built houses out of clay and dreams did his tour of duty in the South Pacific and became a man. Now he feels ready for wood and iron, steel and glass, brook and brick and stone. He feels ready to leave the red fields of his youth for the green hills and blue mountains at the edge of the white world. He feels ready for the covenant of marriage, a shared dream and wider possibilities. So with a vow, he cracks open his dream to rape, make room for another. Together they will build homes not out of clay, but out of a fertile idea. A collection of houses will become a trellis made of homes for their shared dream to hold and grow on. One house, then another, then four more again, collected over a lifetime, each presided over by a sibling, a niece, a nephew, a cousin, a child, a grandchild. These homes became the lattice work upon which the notion of family as nation took hold and flourished on one fruitful vine. This was no private labor. This was done under the warm light of another sun far from the fields of Perry where black dreaming was done in private to avoid the perils. 2019, Seattle, Washington. For 70 years and five generations, this vine flowered and bloomed, fruited and burst, seeded and spread, from Marion to Cascadia, Judkins to Pine. The idea spread and flourished, despite the trellis being beaten and worn by red whip marks scarring the landscape outlining the territory where bankers and brokers and bureaucrats deem dreams should not grow, or if they do, they grow hard, bearing tight, bittersweet fruits. Weakened by this onslaught, sections of the lattice fell away, and the seeds of this vine had to go further and further afield to take root, each vine sprouting up on its own, remembering its strength, still grappling for a hold, alone. And so this notion of family as nation became diasporic. The vine withered and contracted, but the root and stem remained, holding fast to the base of the original lattice on 24th Avenue in the heart of the city, the heart of this improbable black nation. And so, after five generations of life and birth, propagation and death, when it seemed the dream of this vine had died, a desiccated stem pushed out new leaves, then flowered and bloomed. This flower, fragile and singular, the fruit of an idea, an idea of family as nation, an ember it endured in private, where dreams flourish out of sight, of the perils. This dream is our home. Our home is the ember. The ember is the idea. The idea is endurance. The endurance of black dreaming, black family, black song, black stories, black embraces, black smiles, black memories, black tears, black imagination, black solution, black logic, black love, black futures. Wanawari is the home built on a foundation of red clay dreams. 
It is the living whisper of our ancestors, the surviving ember of a watery dream, an overture of the living for the unborn. This is a social, emotional, and family history of Wanawari and the home that gave it purpose. Wanawari is a space dedicated to black art, media, and social connection to fight displacement in the gentrified Central District. It reimagines land use and reasserts what it means to inhabit land based on the values that are true to our being. Wanawari was established in April of 2019 by myself, Alicia B. Johnson, Rachel Kessler, Jill Freeberg, and the dreams of Frank and Goldine Green, Bertie Wilson. Betty Coleman, Zerelda Trent, there's eight of them, <laughs> James Green, Aunt Nita, Aunt Stella, and the rest. You can visit us at wanawari.org and come see us on 24th Avenue and East Marion Street in the Central District. Thank you. I traveled to the southwestern coast of Taiwan to witness the Wang Ye boat burning ceremony, a ritual that centers upon burning and fire as an expression of purification and cleansing. This piece tonight that I'll perform is a reimagination of that ritual brought home to the Pacific Northwest. Butter lamp, incense stick, beeswax votive, the occasion of poem. Rites I enact to set the world aglow with the light of desire, the fire of the mind. A 
adorned in the colors of the eight temples, the caretakers of the Wangye gods march through the streets of the seaside town. The lone envoy bearing a square yoke parades the wooden boat through narrow lanes until nightfall when the barge is brought to rest upon a bed of joss paper. Earlier that night, men load the boat with handwritten wishes, the misfortunes and plague of my past year, to be piloted up to the heavens in a blast of fireworks, deafening the crowd that came to bear witness to ceremony. as each of us does. Some of us bail out before a thing is done to escape our ghosts. We watch it burn. I can't unsnarl the knot of unmet want, so I sever it in heat. Draw the cord into flame to free myself from the clutch of haunting, to disembark at the latitude of where I let go of the ship. My name is Sarah Cahoon, and um, this is my dad, Bill Cahoon. Um, he uh, is from Colorado, where I'm from. Um, the, when I first heard about the theme of the night being fire, I thought of him immediately because he loved fire. He loved blowing things up. Um, he was a dynamite salesman, so <laughs> he loved it that much. Um, so I was thinking, this is actually him at a mining convention with his badge that we would have to go with him to a lot of times. And they were super weird, as you can imagine. Um, but it, it reminded me a lot of like growing up and I was just remembering having dynamite in my garage. Um, and if it got too cold outside, my dad would bring it inside into the basement. Seems really safe. But thankfully, I, I don't really remember, I, didn't, I, I never like, had it in my hands or anything, but I don't want to get him in trouble. Um, but I was also remembering um, growing up, and there, we had these neighbors that had this tree that fell down, and um, they had this big stump that needed to get out. So my dad, being like the, gen like the gentleman he is, he was like, hey, let me, I'll take care of that for you. And they were like, sure, great. And he took dynamite and blew out the stump in their backyard and like blew like a huge hole in their backyard. Like, <laughs> like you could drive a hole through it, or a car through it, I'm sorry. Uh, and I actually, had, I had to ask my mom, I was like, is that, because I had this memory about it and I had to ask my mom if that was actually true. And it, it is true. So I think about my childhood and I'm just like, wow, okay. I made it here. <laughs> um, 
But my dad is an amazing dad. I mean, he's the sweetest. He lives in Colorado. He has Parkinson's now, so it's very sad, but he's still fiery and crazy, if you can imagine. Um, but this next song is actually, I wrote it about Colorado, and it's a canyon in Colorado called Deer Creek Canyon. It's in Littleton, Colorado, and my whole family's still out there. So my mom lives up on top, and my dad's down on top of the mountain. My mom is in the bottom. Or, sorry, my mom is on the top of the mountain, and my dad, sorry, I'm nervous, um, is on the basement, in the basement. Whatever, Tomo. I mean, I don't know. I'm here to play music, you know. Anyways, um, this song... <laughs> I'm thankful to have Tomo, Elena, and Chris help me tonight, and um, thank very honored to be here tonight for you all.
Hi, I'm Judy. I grew up just down the street in Tacoma, but uh, yeah, I've lived here in Seattle for the last several years studying climate change. I started this work running model simulations on supercomputers to study Antarctic sea ice. And that got me in the habit of recognizing that a single trend line in climate data might represent change that has cascading effects on people and ecosystems. But I didn't recognize that was a habit until I taught my first undergrad class on climate change. And then I saw that this crisis was still very abstract and intellectual to students, because we approached it as a physics problem. So I began experimenting with different ways of representing climate data. And I started paying much closer attention to how people relate to information about climate. For example, after learning about the rapid warming in the Arctic, I'd survey students and ask what kind of associations they make to the loss of sea ice. I've asked this question of several hundred students now. And before I tell you the results, let me ask you all the same question. So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Arctic sea ice loss? <laughs> You're not supposed to say it out loud. <laughs> but that's OK. So hold it in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> and try not to be biased by other people. <laughs> okay, so I found that the students' responses fall roughly into four different categories. Okay, so show of hands here. Uh -huh. You guys are a good sample size. Um, how many of you thought of polar bears or animals or ecosystems? Hands up and look around so you can see each other. Yeah, a lot. You're kind of dark up here on stage, but it's a lot. How about um, snow or ice or glaciers or ice sheets, what we call the cryosphere? OK. Um, and how about climate change or sea level rise? Pretty many. And how many of you thought of Arctic communities and human impacts? Just a few. OK, so in class surveys, I found that less than 1% of the students report associations to Arctic communities and to people. So kind of like what we found here. But 4 million people live in the Arctic. Many are indigenous, with connections to the land and the ice that go back thousands of years. And yet the most common way that we talk about Arctic sea ice data is by showing how the total area of ice has changed over time. And that perspective helps us determine the scale of change, but no one experiences the total area of sea ice. That's something only satellites can see. So I'm going to share with you another way of connecting to the science, using satellite data of sea ice at a particular place in the Chukchi Sea, right next to Shishmaruf, Alaska. And instead of seeing this data, you're going to hear it. The satellites can tell us when the sea ice begins to melt each spring, and when it starts freezing again later in the year. And the length of the melt season changes year to year and place to place, but it's grown longer over time. So in order to hear how the seasons are changing, I've made a scout soundscape to represent each season. So the freeze season sounds like this. And the melt season sounds like this. And the length of time that you hear each soundscape represents the length of that season each year, as told by the satellite record. You're also going to hear the voices of four people with place-based and scientific perspectives on this region. So now let's listen. There's a lot of sea ice in the world, you know? And it's good for the planet because it reflects sunlight. It keeps the planet cooler. I think one of the most important uses is it's like suppresses waves so that ocean waves don't crash into the coastlines. And that was just dependable in the past to know that the ice was going to protect you from giant ocean waves, and it's not so much anymore. So every fall time we have storm surges. When the storm comes in, the waves will come and take away the land. 
you know, recent years, we see the sea ice freezing later and later. I remember one year it didn't freeze until the end of January, which was very strange. Now we don't know when the ice is going to break up because of climate change. It's more than just polar bears. It's more than just the ice. It's, it's actual people having to move their homes, their loved ones that they bury in their home. Really, the goal is pretty simple, ultimately. It's just we have to stop burning fossil fuels, period, right? And uh, that, that the big question is how. Sometimes when we get really bogged down about this weight and this responsibility, we have to remind ourselves that indigenous people were never in this for instant gratification. We were always in it for futurity and for longevity. It was always for, sometimes the fruits of your labors aren't seen until the next generation or the next, next, next generation. Since working with Hannah and Esau, I've shifted the way that I think about time, and it's inseparable from my own relationship to this place. So to explain, I'm going to tell you a story about Horace Knapp. Horace was born in Titusville, Pennsylvania, 1845. He was orphaned as a child, and when he was 16, he lied about his age to enlist in the Union Army with his older brother, Byron. A year into the war, Byron died. Horace stayed on until the war ended in 1865 when he was 20 years old. Later, he moved out west. He prospected for gold in Nome, Alaska. He would have stocked up for supplies just down the street here in Pioneer Square. When he was 44 years old, he was back in Washington, and he paid $23.75 for 19 acres of land that was stolen from the Coast Salish people on Carr Inlet. Horace married Josephine Fuller, started a family, donated some of their stolen land to build a school, and founded the town of Purdy near Gig Harbor. They built and owned a logging camp on the Burley Lagoon, and they sold ancient trees to the naval shipyards in Bremerton. And Horace was my great-great-grandpa. So my connection to this place is shaped by settlers who lived with the trauma of war and loss, and who took and exploited the lands of the Coast Salish people. And today, our wildfires are worse not only because it's hotter, but because settlers degraded the forests. And our warming world is a consequence of that short-sighted and broken relationship to land and to people. When we acknowledge that it's so much more than statistics and data, that it's part of our own messy 
intergenerational stories of family and place, then I think we begin to grasp the timescales of climate change and the long-lasting effects of our choices in this present moment. So coming back to Haley Hanna's words about futurity, I'll leave you with a question. What legacy will we leave for our great-great-grandchildren who are sure to inherit a much hotter world? Thank you. time. Will we keep this a place for all of us? Will we keep this place we love? I want to thank Tomo Nakayama as the curator of our sixth Ampersand Live. And our musicians that kept everything together. And I want to especially thank Tomo's good, great spirit in pulling together an amazing lineup of artists. I'd like to welcome the artists out on the stage. And as Paul and Ken said, won't you gratitude. Thank you so much, all of you. And thank you, all of you.